Hello, hello, everybody. You're in a laundry room. That's the... That's the point of the song. I'm so happy to be here with you on a Thursday. (laughs) Week's over. A Thursday night in March. It's March 2nd. March 2nd, 2023, and we've got a great show for you tonight. I am excited to bring back Stephen Jonathan as our guest because every time he is on, it is really earth-rattling. I'm telling you, as as amazing as it is to have Jay Gulanello in to do nutrition nights and to talk about the human body and things that we're overlooking whenever we put uh, processed foods and anything else in our mouths and timing of eating and, and, and everything else... I think that those are so such an uh, such amazing broadcasts, and it might not be as glitzy and glamorous as the the good old us against the deep state episodes, but uh, they're really amazing. And I think that on a similar level, Steve and Jonathan coming on to talk about education, like few of like Robin McCutcheon and and, and others who come on to talk about this stuff. Uh, the, this just fills a need, and tonight is going to be an extension of what we talked about with him uh, last time he was on with the trivium and the quadrivium and uh, and how people can provide an authentic education for children outside of the school system as it is right now. Well, tonight I wanted to save this particular topic for one evening, and that is theology. How does a lay person, how does, how does someone... Uh, who's not very articulate about some things, find a way to be articulate about the existence of God for a child or something like that. How does one who's taking education into their own hands for their children, for their family, how did they start being able to really introduce a person to the presence of God? I mean, I know that's something that you, you feel, and that you're able to define better as time goes on. You understand what you're connected to constantly, but uh, but but how do you how do you start that that uh, education, that line of it? So theology as a science. Then we're going to be talking about how science itself, since it, it has been stripped of faith, has now become a faith unto itself. And there's just just there's so much. And I, at the end. At the end of this, ladies and gentlemen, I have a a really nice little way of ending the show. Nice little way of ending the show. We're going to watch a... Well, I'll tell you once we get there. It's going to be a good one. At least I really am confident that it is going to be. This is the kind of episode I would listen to a couple of times. Uh, let's just hope that the end result is <laughs> is everything I hope it is. So that's what we have on this March 2nd, 2023 and uh, please go to the affiliates page on quitefrankly.tv and get to know all of our friends and affiliates. The links are there. The promo codes are there. Uh, they're all American businesses. They are small to mid-sized businesses. They are members of this audience. They are of you guys and gals. So see what you can you can supplement in your life from the affiliates page instead of going to Amazon or Walmart or anything like that. Go ahead and do it. Very, very important things there. And thank you very much. That's my my plug for the evening. Aside from become a sponsor of the show, because I released the I released the sessions for C.S. Lewis book club. But remember, four days from now, on the sixth of March, I just put out the first official book club thread for brave new world we are going to be reading chapters one through three that's pages one through 56 jay dyer is ready to go it's going to be 8 30 p.m on monday it'll be a little bit of a shorter seven o'clock show that night but maybe i'll go live a little bit earlier so it doesn't sting that bad but uh these are going to be great sessions because you know we're just like with timothy gordon bringing his own special flair to the program when we start doing book clubs and we talk windswept house and malachi martin and all that uh, you know that Jay Dyer is going to bring the heat. He's already wa- read this book and done however many deep dives on this book several times on his own uh, website. So it, it's going to be great. And then adding you guys and gals into it, your observations through these threads, book club is awesome. It really is. So uh, make sure you, you sign up and, and have a good time with us. 
there is that. Another thing I have to announce, unfortunately, we will not be having uh, Dr. McCullough on the show tomorrow. Thankfully, I emailed him today as I try to email all of our guests about 24 to 48 hours out just to confirm and start getting all the particulars together, exchange Zoom links and all that. And uh, he simply just re responded back that he's going to be at CPAC on the floor. I said, oh, okay, well, that's, but that's unfortunate. Uh, is there any, any weeks coming up that you're flexible that we can reschedule? I haven't gotten anything back yet. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I, have, I, had so, I have so many great questions lined up that I guess I'll just have to put on a notepad somewhere for when the day does come back. And it's one of those things that makes me start thinking, should I not put the upcoming guests on the website? Should I not promote what's going I want people to get excited, but I also want to really trust that in, in you know, 90, 90 to 95% of everybody that I put on the schedule doesn't cancel and there's no problem, but maybe it should just be a surprise day to day. Th days like today make me wonder about that. And also makes me very happy that I, I confirm at least 24 to 48 out. But um, well, I'll, I'll work on getting Dr. Peter McCullough back because he's a great guest and I had a lot of important questions to ask him. But we're still going to have Jay Gulinello and Matt in tomorrow night. And that still, it's going to be a very fast two hours. It's going to be great. No doubt about it. Um, man, I think this is the first time that Matt and Jay are meeting, I think. So I, I, I can just imagine what he's gonna be asking and um, that'll be great. So we'll see you tomorrow at seven o'clock. Okay, good night. So that's what I had and, um, and yeah, moving on. So as you know, we, there's a lot of different changes going on at YouTube right now. First of them, I saw that I saw the quartering brought uh, it to everybody's attention the other day that there has been a major shift in what YouTube is being allowed is allowing to be seen. There's more tinkering going on with the algorithm over there. They're demoting, in a sense, long form content content like talk shows like ours in order to boost the smaller and the the appeal and everything else of the smaller shorts and reels that are going on out there. Uh, so uh, definitely I have to get in on shorts and reels. I, I tried my first one today and um, the team over here at Quite Frankly is gonna help me out, the video editing team. We gotta really just saturate that area to, to try to get more people to see the show. Because what you guys and gals are doing to help out with liking and sharing, it goes a long way. It really does and that can't stop. But I noticed it about, you know, the first six weeks of the of the year, we're making headway. Then all of a sudden, the last couple of weeks, there's a we're getting sluggish again. I said, like, "What the hell?" And, and of course, that's what they're doing. They're demoting long, uh, long form stuff. And when you're when you're, uh, you're you're fighting to even get attention of the people who already subscribe to you, ugh, just make sure you subscribe if you m must be on YouTube. But if not, if you don't really care where you are, watch the show on Rumble. Um, if you don't care where you are because it's a lot more responsive It's gonna tell you when we're live when you like the the episode It's gonna put us on top 50 because we're we're strong enough to make things happen for us over there But with YouTube just be diligent and interact and everybody else on on D live and twitch and uh, and uh, You know theta foxhole on quite frankly dot TV rockfin you guys just keep enjoying yourselves and your little jacuzzis and uh, with all your nipple twisting and things like that, you, you're all you're just so awesome, all of you. Thank you very much for being here in whatever form, in whatever form. But here's something else that's going on there. YouTube CEO says it's developing AI features with thoughtful guardrails. This is according to Reclaim the Net. You know that um, they have a new CEO because Susan left. In an annual letter, YouTube's new CEO, Neil Moen, highlighted the video sharing platform's priorities for the year 2023. Among the priorities ex is exploring the opportunities that generative artificial intelligence can provide while also setting guidelines for its use. Here's a quote. The power of AI is just beginning to emerge in ways that will reinvent video and make the seemingly impossible possible. Moen wrote, adding that the platform would take time to come up with, quote, thoughtful guardrails for the use of AI features. I just can't wait to see what guardrails are put up. 
Stay tuned in the coming months as we roll out tools for creators as well as protections to embrace this technology responsibly. I wonder if they're going to give creators a tool to actually have their their uh, their videos seen by their subscribers. Because I don't ask for much in life, but I worked very hard over years on all these platforms across the board to gain subscribership and to bring on guests and to and to uh, you know just just build things up to create buzz. And here we are, and still knocking on the door of 100,000 subscribers. I would be, it would be fantastic if I could have some kind of a creator tool to just say, hi, everybody that voluntarily subscribes to me, I'm still alive. That'd be cool. But I'm sure that that's not what they're going to give us. So we'll see what that is, uh, that's all about. He, um, Moen, if you want to know exactly what the, the sentimentality of this guy is, made one of his most infamous statements on this topic in 2020 about authoritative sources, you know, boosting news, mainstream corporate news on YouTube because everyday people were being too influential and in starting authentic conversations. He said creators espousing opinions in their basements can't provide context on the news. He used this basement analogy to justify the importance of boosting authoritative sources on the, that means, that means Fox, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, all of them. So I'm sure that these new AI tools are not going to be anything to write home about. Uh, here's another one for you. The UN, this is from The Guardian, the UN urged to intervene over destruction of U.S. abortion rights. The UN, intervene. I mean, go fuck yourself, UN. That's what I have to say. And you want another thing I want to say there, too? Everybody talking about, obviously, NATO is a big thing here, too. These days, NATO, NATO, NATO. Zelensky, in that same interview where he's talking about how, you know, slapping us on the wrist over here in the U.S. for not wanting to give more and more and more guns, ammo, tanks, cash. By the way, another support package is getting readied by the federal government to be sent out. The theft is endless, and we are powerless. We are completely deballed, completely neutered. We are here, many of you are, Many of you are in the early goings of March now preparing, if not have already submitted your taxes for 2023 uh, on filing 2022s. Okay, I got to do that over the course of this week, which means in the next couple of weeks, I'm sure I will be sending in a check to the IRS. I will be I will be sending them my my uh, what, what would I even call this? What would I even call this? Because it's. It's a way for me to stay out of jail. That's it. I'm not getting anything from it. Nothing whatsoever. Um, I'm part of a demographic that is that is hated. And 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 continue to ask be asked more and more of what. So what is it? It's really just to keep people like me and you out of jail. We get nothing from it. All the trust funds that they set up for Social Security and everything else that's supposed to be a trust bankrupt it's all being supplemented by loans so what are we doing so what are we doing as our as our the fruits of our labor are sent off to washington dc to the treasury they are sending billions upon billions to that fucking coke addict that coke addict in in uh, in ukraine who's nothing but an actor doesn't even really have any power so, yeah, so as far as NATO goes, as we keep getting reminded about that, like, well, you, don't you care about NATO? It's so important. No, I don't. If you're going to tell me, Frank, you have a choice between having one American life lost in Eastern Europe or having NATO collapse and Russia completely consuming uh, Ukraine, which it probably, which it doesn't even want. It wants a buffer. It wants a neutral, it wants neutrality. It wants neutrality, a neutral buffer between itself and the crazy NATO alliance. 
that of course at the same time needed so much of its energy to be supplied from Russia. It's the most, it's the craziest psychopathic thing you can never think of. If you gave me that choice, I would say let it all burn with NATO. Let it all come down, collapse, and that's it. Not one American life or anybody's life is worth keeping NATO afloat. It's not worth NATO. Not at all. That's my humble opinion. But I'll don't worry, I will pay every last penny of taxes because all I care about is staying out of jail. That's the only thing I care about. Horrible way to live for all of us. But that's really what it is. Has nothing to do with patriotic duty. Nothing. And here you go. Here's another here's another one for you. CTV. More than half of the world will be overweight or obese. Obese by 2035. Just wanted to throw that out there. No, nothing else has to be said. Now, again, as you know, we've been given permission by now the FBI and other government agencies to accept the COVID virus, to accept now that the COVID virus ha uh, was engineered in a lab and whether or not that lab that it was engineered in was in Wuhan, its ground zero infection moment was in, Lu it was in Wuhan. We got from the very beginning, you know, people say, oh, you got lucky, you didn't know what the hell was going on. No, if you were paying attention and you didn't need Brian Stelter to be blowing smoke up your ass the entire time to call that news, then you would have read these reports out of India, who were the first ones to say that, hey, uh, this has been Frankenstein with HIV. Uh, this could only have been done in a laboratory. But no, you were, you were on the bat soup. If you were one of the people who were on the bat soup line of things, and obviously this is all gonna be very disconcerting to you. And you're gonna need a way to psychologically bail yourself out of being pulled along willingly, I guess, in many ways, for a three year lie. Either way, it's limited. It's limited in its, in its disclosure. So this is where we are right now. We watched how uh, Stephen Colbert avoided taking the L by making jokes about how the Department of Energy needs to stay in its lane and talk about energy and not bio, bio, biology, okay? that That's how he got out of having to uh, take the L there. Jimmy Kimmel took a crack at it too and pretty much claimed that Trump and his minions were only right because we got lucky. And even then, they're not really right about much. Blah, blah, blah. It's just whatever. This This is what they do now. This is late night entertainment. If I was ending my nights watching things like Colbert and Kimmel, I mean, my nightmares would be far more than far worse than they already are. How do people end their nights and go to bed relaxed and feeling good, ready for a new day? Oh my God. It's like going to a support group, but a bad one. It's not even a support group. It's like, it's like going to a, it's like going to a crack den. It's not a support group. You would think it would be like that. Like you can go and turn on television at night and relax with something, a variety, an old Ed Sullivan variety show or something. Here's somebody's going to come on. He's going to juggle chainsaws or something like that. Oh, wow. Wow. Isn't that something? And then you go to bed and, and, uh, and you're a little bit more, the tension has been broken up. You know, that is almost like group therapy. This is like going to a crack den every night. That's what it's like watching television and you don't feel it. If you're addicted, obviously you just need it. But, um, they had their their time their turn and so did the ogres on the view i have a minute long clip for you it won't be that much longer than that because i don't want to lose my dinner either uh the ogres on the view they added their bird brains to the mix here listen to this here they are blaming trump's xenophobia they're blaming his and, and jimmy kimmel tried taking this this route a little bit too but it's it's particularly interesting to watch them really trying to rev their brains up and put put this all together they're blaming trump's xenophobia for discrediting the lab leak theory that obviously now wasn't that bad of a theory okay so here well, let's watch it trump unleashed this xenophobia he, st he stopped allowing chinese people to come to the country <laughs> it's not just, it's all right there like they, they can't they can't help themselves they stopped travel from china it's not that there was, you know, a Chinese person might have been coming back home to the United States. Departing flight for this Chinese person could have been in 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 uh, in Spain, and they didn't let them on the flight because they're Chinese. That wasn't happening. But 
she knows what's this one's name sunny she knows she has stupid people watching he then started calling it the um don't even don't say, say it. it don't yeah, even he say it. don't don't say it whatever you do don't say it the most ugly thing in the world to call it the china virus oh no don't please refrain Something. And he kept on saying yeah. China, China, and doing yeah. this thing. Yeah. Because if he didn't, you guys would say that it came from 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 Mar-a-Lago. If he didn't keep re- reminding people that this came from the outside in, and it wasn't, a, you would have made it his fault. You would have said that he was constructing the virus in Mar-a-Lago. He had the goggles on. He had the white coat on. He was in his own little laboratory in his bedroom. You would have said it because you're fucking nuts. I would have been reminding people every day that it came from outside the country, too, if I was up against you nonstop. Where I was even concerned as someone who had lost family members for Manny to even bring it up. And that is really sad. The last guy before Biden. She can't even say his name. (laughs) Fucking pathetic. Said anything about this. He made it about Asian people. No. And... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you actually hear that? That was that was the view. The actual producers at the view boosting the audio from the audience to get that mm-hmm. I'm sure John Stewart didn't realize that that's what was happening because I'm sure he didn't know what was going on all over the country with Asian folks getting smacked and hit and people saying stuff to them. First of all, those were not MAGA, okay? That was that's not the the the, uh, the the nationwide Jussie Smollett moment over here. All right, that you stop with the you stop with the Asian hate campaign because um, it was becoming apparent that most of the people beating up on Asians it probably had nothing to do even with the virus. Okay, it was just not white Republicans. Let's just say that. Let's just say that. Okay. Now you may be saying to yourself, this is incredible. Am I seeing what I am seeing? And yes, you are. You are watching these these hags, these cheesecake eating hags in real time. First, make up something about Donald Trump that's not real, okay? And then blame him for whatever they made up, all to sidestep admitting he was right. <laughs> it's a, I feel like I'm a, on a safari right now. About bringing the disease here. I mean, this was this was what was happening. And if you know who had not started it with that, had he not made it about that, had he said, "Listen, this might have come out of a lab," it probably would have been listened to a lot different. Oh, oh, it would have been a lot. They would have taken it seriously. They would have taken it seriously. They would have given him credit. They would have given. That's that's what's going on here. I mean, it's just. I mean, that's just incredible. It's incredible to watch Sunny, uh, the, the the Sunny woman in in uh, especially really putting that brain to use. It's like watching a short order cook. It's like why and and no offense to short order cooks, you do what you. I mean, people go to your luncheonette for a reason, but you're not making souffles over there. You know, you're not making nobody's you know, right. So it, it's like watching watching the view is like watching short order cooks trying to make a souffle. That's the best way I can describe this without being really, really insulting. And you know I love, love insulting these people. I love insulting every last one of them. It keeps me alive. Do you understand? So just remember, just remember to hold your breath. Oh, I mean, oh don't hold your breath. If you ever think that there is going to be a, a, a moment of unifying clarity coming from these vicious, unintelligent people, these hags. Don't hold your breath. They will be attempting to refit the same. If reality is, if reality is a one thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, they've got three pieces, and they will spend the rest of eternity trying to refit the three pieces in different ways to make it all make sense because they don't understand why they're always on the wrong page of things. That, that's, that's what's going on. It's so much worse, and they don't know it. Their fate is so much worse than Sisyphus having to push the rock all the way up the hill and have it come all the way down again because they don't even know that they've got a, a worse fate than Sisyphus. 
My gosh. They, I mean, they'll, they all have been in hell for a thousand years, and still they'll be muttering about Donald Trump. So, um, my oh my. All right, 719. We got to get started because I have to set the stage for Steve and Jonathan. I don't want to delay too much, but I have to get through this in order to bring him on. So don't go anywhere. Share the show far and wide. Get all your friends to come watch, and we'll have a good time tonight. Let's do it. One ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Let's rock! school you know it's so much stuff to do tonight and i this i'm excited to be a part of the audience as well i can't wait to ask these questions and have a talk with steve and jonathan great to always have him on but what are we going to be discussing by the way you can send over super chats to quite frankly superchat.com we will read those in the second half of the show a lot of things to do in the second half related to the first gonna be a very consistent theme i like when we have that balance but um there's also your rumble rants i can't wait to read those and just keep liking the show if there's any platform you have not liked tonight's episode on yet go do it and then take it down i don't know i don't know just 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 go send it to everybody you know say like, listen i know you know you don't know anything about this person just please like this video thank you almost like you're in church and they're coming around with the donation basket that's what you should be doing All right. Now, here's what I wanted to bring up. Since we're talking about education tonight, get a load of this. She fled the war in Ukraine but failed to find a safe haven in San Francisco Middle School. This is from the San Francisco Chronicle just a few days ago. Everything Yana, a 13-year-old Ukrainian refugee, knew about public schools in the United States was that she had been on te- what she had seen on television or in the movies, often idyllic settings where teenage conflict and angst ironed itself out by the end. Uh, she never imagined herself in those American classrooms. Then the bombs started falling after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Again, yeah, well, it's terrible, terrible, terrible. And Yana and her mom fled for their lives in March, leaving friends, family, and memories of typical teenage lives filled with choir practice, art classes, and homework behind. Imagine that. Terrible at what the CIA has done to countless happy homes and stable cultures around the world. It's not just Ukraine. It's just their turn. It's just their turn right now. Think about, think about uh, again, one, over a, a million dead Iraqis. But yes, thank you, San Francisco Chronicle, for for, uh, reminding us the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Carrying the trauma of war and a few personal belongings, the pair eventually landed in San Francisco, where she started the new semester in January, despite speaking little English. There, she joined hundreds of city students reeling from their own tragedies, loss of loved ones in the pandemic, poverty, and homelessness. Like Yana, other students had fled their home countries to escape violence and death. It didn't take Yana long to realize that 
Real life in her eighth grade class at Marina Middle School was nothing like the scenes that played out on her screen. I thought I was going to be better because it's San Francisco, she said in Ukrainian with her aunt translating. But after two days, I saw everything going on at the school. The students interrupted classes, jumped on desks, cursed at teachers. At first, Yana wondered what was going on, but then nothing happened. Students were not disciplined or prevented from repeat behavior. After one week, I understood that was normal, said Yana, whose name the Chronicle agreed not to publish in accordance with the source policy. Not uh, not long after, Yana said she became a target. Her experience echoes what many parents and teachers have said is escalating problem in the city's middle schools with bullying, violence, and defiant students creating an untenable learning environment. While the situation has worried many students, staff, and parents, for a girl already fleeing violence and chaos, it's been particularly difficult. And everything that has been nutshelled there is expanded upon in the, the later parts of the article. Just, um, just really hammering home how bad it is in schools, especially in cities. Now, I know, uh, like everything else, you can't broad stroke it stroke at all. I'm sure that uh, some of your children are having decent experiences in schools. You're in good parts of the country, in stable parts of a certain state, and you know a lot about the school administration and the curriculum, and you're actually quite happy with the education you're getting, and that's fine. That's fine, but by and large, we know what's going on, and by and large, we know the trend of what we're getting out, what the return on investment we are getting out of federalized education by way of Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, Department of Education since 1978, where we're going and what the trajectory has been, which it has only been downward. And then you add every other cultural situation and condition that we talk about every night into the mix, and you know where this is all coming from. But what's the fix? (laughs) Well... Throwing money at that is not going to be a fix. But this is something that may be a part of it. Maybe because we've been, we, we, uh, we, we are, are, are missing parts of a culture, as we were talking about last night. What's going on with the depression? What's going on with what the, the culture people are living in right now? And let's talk about two things that are and have always been very important to uh, satisfaction and happiness and fulfillment in life. That is community ties with our neighbors and also the loss of the oral tradition of storytelling, knowing our past and and being connected to the the elders in our tribe, you know, not throwing knives at them in the middle, you know, throwing things at them and 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 being dis- and beating them up when they when they take away your Nintendo in the middle of class and starting fist fights. I mean, that's what we're going on here. You know, that's a big part of it all. That that intergenerational that that severing. That severing between generations that there's nothing that we really have going uh, or invested in each other anymore. At least that's where we're heading. This was a very surprising thing. Now on to faith, because we didn't talk about faith last night, but it does tie in with everything else, with being good neighbors, with t- telling the stories and, and passing on our traditions. But this was very surprising. And maybe it could be double speak or whatever, or maybe it's just a moment of clarity with a man that otherwise we wouldn't have very much anything else to agree on. Democratic Mayor Eric Adams over here in New York City, he said the following. Oh, this is from the Daily Caller, I should say. This Democratic mayor has more spine than most GOP leaders. And why is that? The GOP is traditionally thought of as the party of faith, freedom, and family, which is why it's embarrassing when New York City's Democratic mayor, Eric Adams, has more of a spine than most Republican leaders. Adams' chief chief advisor, Ingrid Lewis Martin, introduced the mayor Tuesday during an interfaith breakfast, saying the Adams administration does not believe it must separate church from state. Adams doubled down on the idea, saying, quote, Don't tell me about no separation of church and state. State is the body. Church is the heart. You take the heart out of the body, the body dies. I can't separate my belief because I'm an elected official. When I walk, I walk with God. When I talk, I talk with God. When I put policies in place, I put them in in with a God-like approach to them. That's who I am. Now, like I said, separate the reality of who Eric Adams is as a politician and what those ideas are. And what those things he says when he says he's talking with God, 
um, they're the two different things and start makes may start making you wonder what, what God is he talking about? Who's God? But the fact that he did this ruffled a lot of feathers. He said this, he said, uh, going on to, to attribute a spike in crime in the city as part of being a lack of faith. Adams also said the next generation is being destroyed because they have not been instilled with some level of faith, faith and belief in God. He predictably drew rebuke from those on the left who decried his comments as unconstitutional because of the alleged separation of church and state, which I promise you we will end the show with doing a little bit more on that. And I think we're going to be doing it in a I can't wait for the end of the show, but I don't want to rush anything because we have a fantastic guest coming on with us tonight. And that guest is Stephen Jonathan. So let me read a little bit uh, a little bit to you about Stephen Jonathan as he makes his way to the stage. He is the founder of the City of Truth, a resource for homeschooling parents and teachers who want to recover the true liberal arts tradition. Uh, you can find all of his work at cityoftruth.co. When he was on last time, we talked about that, and when we were talking, uh, discussing the trivium and the quadrivium. He's the founder of St. Isidore's Artisan Academy at Stella Maris Ranch in Seadrift, Texas. Um, let me see what else we have. Okay. He is the executive director of the St. Thomas More Teaching Fellowship for the Archdiocese of Boston Catholic Schools. Stephen is a senior fellow at the Cardinal Newman Society and a senior fellow at the American Principles Project. He is a writer and public speaker on culture and education. Stephen's primary mission is to articulate the nature and purpose of an authentic education. And I love the way... I love the way that that just, that just sounds. Stephen, an authentic education. I love the way that that's described. And uh, I, I want an authentic education badly. Me too. <laughs> that's, uh, how have you been, by the way? It's been weeks, but uh, it always feels like months with all my, my returning friends and guests. Honestly, it's been great. Thanks for having me again, Frank. I was on uh, the East Coast last time I talked to you. Now I'm on the West Coast. Yeah, I can see that you still have the lights on over there. The sun is still yes. shining. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I know that this is, I, I only want to t take this uh, a couple of seconds. Hold on. I, 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 whatever. Um, I know this is far too complex of an issue to nutshell. And last night I covered a rising, the, the story of rising depression rates in teens, especially liberal teens. But the disruptive behavior, violence against teachers, everything else, um, wh where do you uh, attribute that to? Uh, because obviously it's, it's a big thing. Is it really, is it the family? Is it the family and faith? It's uh, wh where have we lost our way and becoming so uh, physically, physically uh, disruptive with each other? Uh, one thing people don't really understand is the role that the public schools play in this. They have an underlying aim. This is truly their goal. It's to disrupt the nuclear family. They, in a sense, they have to destroy the family for their plan to work, which is they want to use the children in the schools to solve social problems. And so they have been attacking and eroding the family for generations. And the schools are so inhumane and so anti-human and anti-moral and anti-intellectual that they've reduced our kids to emotive, almost robots. And so when emotions are the highest thing, as you see in social emotional learning, it's no wonder that violence is not only increasing, but becoming more and more acceptable as a response to things. Hmm. So what you're saying is it's a problem that cannot be fixed with money, but it would be fixed with a change of heart that would be diametrically opposed to the liberal worldview, and therefore, it'll only get worse. Perfectly stated. <laughs> oh, therefore, it will only get worse. Exactly oh, okay. right. Okay. Well, then let's let's get into something a little bit more uh, time tested and true. Last time that you were on, we discussed the trivium, the quadrivium. It, it was a, a real eye opener for people like myself, and I got a lot of great feedback from it. But I asked you. What I, uh, what I find most difficult, uh, a concept for me as a parent who is going to be homeschooling uh, with, his, with his wife, a uh, concept of introducing to my daughter is the, the existence of God. That's something, of course, I feel we know we, we have already grown up in, but we got it from 
teachers. We went to, I went to a Catholic school. Uh, Lauren was in church groups. Obviously, you can always just go there. But it, whenever you're doing, whenever you're doing home, uh, home studies, and, and, and it's now up to the parents to introduce these very complex and, uh, you know, life-altering concepts like the presence of God in our lives, what is does that look like? I would like to talk about the homeschool approach to that and then maybe build on that to talk about theology as a science in general. Yeah, that's a lot there, Frank. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult to begin with this, uh, but it's the right question. So we talked earlier and we said, there is the primary question in an authentic education. And the single first question you have to ask and answer is this, does God exist or is there no God? Because starting there, you take radically different directions. In fact, that question determines that there are only two possible ways to see the world. One, as if God did create the cosmos and the universe, or two, that God didn't. So there are only two possible worldviews. And the thing that holds the millions of perspectives together in error is the supposition that God doesn't exist and we are living a purely material existence. So we have to go back to the question and answer it honestly. This is a question for everybody and it's the first question of an authentic education. It's also the first question of growing into the human person you were meant to become. So it's vital. And, and how should we proceed there? I know. And let me just say there, too, uh, I it would almost be easier, a lot easier for people uh, if it was just the fork in the road came along and it's either there is no God or there is a God. Uh, what happens now, I think, that is even more confusing for children is that you have these, um, these, these uh, I guess, authority figures that take this this hopelessly pluralistic approach to everything where it's oh it's it's all about your truth you know and so yeah you could believe in god you can believe in this you can believe in an aztec god you can believe in a god over here whatever the hell it is but it's it's all about pluralism and how nobody has anything right so it, it would almost be uh, a little bit less cruel to say there's no god than to say that anything you think of is is real and just as valid as the person next to you. I so it's it's a very odd fork in the road. It almost like splinters, like a split hair, and oh, uh, yes, it's nuts, man. Uh, but um, but you laid the groundwork for for what tonight's show is really all about, and that is theology. So yes. the basis basis of this, when we come to a point where, um, you know, spiritual studies. Uh, where religious or spiritual studies are, are castigated now in the, into the dustbin of myths and legends. And suddenly the science itself, we're seeing other science, itself becomes a religion. So yes. let's talk about the actual science of spirituality and theology and, and, and where we start with that. Yeah, and let me back up to your point for just a moment. It's so true that every human soul is religious. To be religious means to bind yourself to the things that you think are most important. So interestingly, there's this inversion that happens if you believe that God doesn't exist. And the inversion looks like this. If God doesn't exist, then you have the arrogation to decide what to worship. And it turns out every case and every time to be a kind of self-worship, even when you're choosing an idol to worship. Mm. So either you're gonna worship the one true God who created the cosmos, or you're gonna worship yourself by, by giving yourself arrogation to give your allegiance to something or someone that's not worthy of it. That's the way this goes. So this arrogation to other things is the foundation of the modern public school. Uh, when you check your email, I sent you a, an amazing quote we might wanna close with that will show there's these two religions. One is self-worship, the other one is worship of the creator and they're truly inverted. They're not two different choices. So we have to begin by, re by remembering that the self-worshippers made our schools mm -hmm. and the self-worshippers invert the order of everything and make up their own reality. So they've taken a word like science and they've abused it into oblivion. I don't know any school teachers I can ask, do you know what the word science means? Because they think it means material science, physics, biology, astronomy, stuff like that. But the word science comes from the root shire, which means to know. 
Science is knowledge, a body of systematic knowledge about the nature of reality. So indeed, we have this field called the material sciences, and they're fascinating, and they're small, and they're directed by the scientific method that ought to be directed by philosophical principles, but the self-worshippers cut material science off from what we know as the science of the mind or mm. the science of the intellect, which is called philosophy. That's why I like self worship Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, that, that that's that's the real thing there. I always want. I always wondered because even when I was coming up, and nobody would ever articulate for this for me, uh, Stephen. It was, it was there was theology, and I just thought, okay, well, that's just another. That's a fancy way of saying, uh, you know, religion class. And we're going to study the Bible, and we're going to know all the Bible stories and the chronology there, and who the family trees and all that stuff. And we lead right up to the New Testament, and and there you have it. And then there was physics class. And, and and there was there was there was there was chem there was biology and uh, and those three they went together the physics chem and biology but but theology even though there's an ology at the end of it you know it, there was there was a bridge that needed to be made where does it fit in on the spectrum of sciences is it just a balancing agent or does it give you uh, other other um, other tools to be employed when you're into material sciences. That's a fantastic question. So we have this constellation of material sciences that you named, chem, bio, physics, and all those, and they're amazing. But there's this sense in which they are the most diminutive and the least they provide the least certain kind of knowledge. In fact, they can only provide probabilities. There is no certainty coming from the material sciences. So interestingly, it's philosophy, the science of the mind, that is a much bigger and all-encompassing science. And the material science, it assists the mind in corroborating principles of truth. And something amazing happens after that. The highest kind of science is called theology. And theology is the very highest. We recognize it as revealed truth, uh, theological studies, the study of God, which is the womb of all true learning. And so here's what we know, the relationship between the sciences go like this. The science of the mind philosophy is the handmaid of theology, which is the womb of all learning and the material sciences are at the service of the mind and the heart. And in that order properly understood, we can enjoy all the sciences and know that they're integrally in interconnected. There are no contradictions. Now, the self-worshippers say the opposite. They say material science, philosophy, and theology are three separate domains. They are, they are non-overlapping magisteria, according to Stephen Gould. But again, he's an arrogant, arrogant self-worshipper. It, it doesn't hold. It's just not true. So there are no sciences that contradict one another. They always work in harmony when properly understood to convey the, the more reality, the, the bigger the science. Well, and, and and as you said, as, as, as everybody is religious, because what we have noticed, if, if if it wasn't already apparent to people prior to 2020, is that as as uh, as you said, the sciences of the mind and, and faith and all that and the spirit that is become more so myth and legend and all that up. We're fresh off of two years now where pseudo scientific medical lockdowns. We are in a pseudo, completely pseudo scientific medical lockdowns where we where we heard the phrase, the mantra, trust the science over and over again. That became the new sign of the cross. You know, the vaccines became the Eucharist. Talk a little bit about science versus scientism, because then I want to get into another thing that you had just said right then uh, when you when you finished. And that is that um, and that they are not uh, mutually exclusive, but they're very interdependent uh, d disciplines. And uh, and I, I want to talk about the the results of the past of that of that that coming together of all those fields. So talk a little bit about science versus scientism. That's right. The last, I don't even know how many generations, um, I can't even say, but let's say for a hundred years, there's been this growing momentum of scientism because of materialism, because of a rejection of all that is immaterial. And this took hundreds of years in the history of philosophy to finally arrive at a point where the consensus says materialism answers everything. I mean, Stephen Hawking, one of his last things he said was, there's no need for God. And he gave this really amateurish circular argument for it in his last book it was it was 
embarrassing as a philosopher, and it impressed people steeped in scientism. I don't know what it did to people in authentic science, but here's something really important to understand. We heard, we have heard so much, so much browbeating about trust the science. I believe in science. It was a Nacho Libre line. Skeleto said, "I believe in science." You know that was really great. It's a great line, but he was mocking us, which is appropriate because you don't believe in a thing like science, and you nailed it. Scientism is a religion. Tony Fauci is the Pope says, when you doubt me, you doubt the science. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing how a whole a, a, well, a country who calls itself educated could fall for that kind of emperor's new clothes. Tony Fauci's naked. When you doubt Tony Fauci, you're not doubting science. In fact, it's super inappropriate to believe in science in the first place. Material science is a methodology. The scientific method is a way of doing investigative inquiry into the nature of things. And so what a farce that is and how embarrassing that our public schools have an entire population willing to fall for scientism and have no real idea what science actually is. Yeah. It's so important and so valuable. It is, and it is, and, and, and as we were saying before, the uh, the fork in, in fork in the road. There's another fork in the road here too, and that is this scenario where it, it almost seems as you can be religious, you can have religious beliefs, or you could be a scientist. Or and and if you happen to be two, you have got to put your religious beliefs at the door, um, and and any kind of uh, theological understandings or philosophical understandings, and leave it at the door because we're dealing with now. It's just time for the microscopes, and it's time for the solutions, and it's time for the uh, the telescopes to to kick in and do all the work. Um, we it almost seems if you're taking what we hear from the talking heads and and all of the the big galaxy brains of our time that we didn't start making any significant advancements in astronomy in mathematics in chemistry until the atheists arrived it almost seems that way and and, and that's not to say that i i have agnostic and atheist friends who have so much more moral grounding than than uh, most people uh, in the world that that are uh, you know gallivanting on television and stuff like that. So it's not even really a knock on people and where they are in their personal journey in life uh, when it comes to spirituality. But when it comes to again this this trying to keep separate the mind and the heart from the physical and and the uh, these these other sciences, can you talk a little bit about scientific discovery? under religious bodies because every every major religion has fantastic uh, uh resumes I mean, islam judaism uh christianity the catholic church in particular incredible uh advancements in science over the course of centuries and uh and and that was with that was with keeping uh, uh, that god consciousness in mind that's right it's a really important point if you even look at the ancient greeks like plato and aristotle and the great ancient romans and greeks and the hebrews you look at their scientific discoveries and their principles of truth on the nature of things has endured if you look at the atheists from the enlightenment up and their discoveries what you see is a revolving door of ever evolving theories and they even know today these things we're saying now about dark matter will be different in 50 years it's an admission that it's not true now if it's not going to be true then. And the great discoveries in science were by guys like Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle gets endless criticism and ridicule by the modern scientists because he didn't have beakers and micro microscopes and telescopes and things like that. But he discovered the principles of physics that endure truthfully through today. The idea of the four causes, these, these wonderful principles of truth, the discoveries, the the Galileos even. Galileo was a Catholic. Descartes was a Catholic. Uh, most of the great minds in the history were, were, of course, men of the faith who understood that theology and revealed truth is the mysterious womb. Philosophy is the science of the mind where we encounter certain truths, and the material sciences are ways of testing. They all knew this until this modern age. And think here's the key here. The devil is a synonym with the word divide. Division, division, division. When we when we see great thinkers dividing and dividing and dividing, that's a telltale sign that they're they're tearing something down, that they're doing something destructive. Our job as good thinkers and scientists 
and theologians and philosophers is to see integrally unify how things fit together, the hierarchical order of loves, the moral good, the truths that endure. We ought to see beyond the material to the realm of being where all hangs together in the created cosmos. The word cosmos means order. The modern scientist is creating disorder or destroying the cosmos as we know it. Mm. Yeah, speaking of the cosmos, this is something that, that I, I, I think about a lot, Stephen. Um, it, the, the, one of the bigger problems that I have when I listen to someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, over the year, uh, up until, especially up until the last five or six years, he's become a little bit uh, just too obnoxious for me. But I, I still love every once in a while I, I'll listen to old radio interviews he did. And, and very good. They're very good for just blowing your mind with everything that could, that could be gathered through technological advancement, just learning about things, learning how the earth uh, moves, how everything moves. It, it's, just, it's really incredible. But no matter how smart and advanced people are, it always comes down to one thing. We always hit that wall at the beginning. That's the crazy thing about all of this stuff. Usually people hit the wall at the end of a journey, but for us, it's at the beginning. When it, when we Whether it's Big Bang or one thing or another, what's the, the question? How did absolutely nothing, can you even conceive of nothing, how did nothing become suddenly everything? How does nothing explode? I mean, they, they don't have the adequate answers, of course, but just like, uh, you know, just like these puzzling trends we see with you know, people dropping like flies with heart inflammation all of a sudden, there are just certain things that are not allowed to be considered, namely the metaphysical God. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, as I, as I told you before, I wanted to really hit that point, how the, how, uh, the scientism hits the wall at the beginning, not the end. Yeah, material, scientism, material reductionism, of course it hits the wall at the end. The most prominent ph physicist out there today, Lawrence Krauss, he, I heard him say, the Big Bang, everything in the universe was reduced down to zero point. Think of that contradiction. And it just exploded. And w in the beginning, it was a nothing, but a very mysterious nothing, <laughs> says the atheist Lawrence Krauss. And it's, it's just ridiculous. Now, Father Lemaitre posited the Big Bang theory which 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 it, it, it makes sense that out of nothing comes something it's a first principle of the created order that nothing that something cannot come from nothing that's a first principle it's a self-evident truth so the only real answer is a creator a being outside of time and space an uncreated creator or an unmoved mover or the first cause this this will endure because it's true, and it's a thing that needs to be discovered by all souls, but it's also a thing that's self-evident unless you're steeped in scientism, which inverts the order and makes you the arbiter of all truth. It makes you the main knower. It's a huge mistake. It actually makes people unteachable. It's a phenomenal thing our schools have done. They've made them arrogant, unteachable, close-minded, and they have said just the opposite. Uh, that right there... Stephen, I actually think is the to me, and I would love to know where else you think the uh, where else you can you can uh, point out the strong suits and the real ways that faith, that theology in app uh, uh, applicable sciences and experiments and in the pursuit for knowledge, what other strong suits it has, how it enhances a scientific endeavor. But for me, for for someone who's not really in this field, but just just wonders where it may apply. I can see how faith can be an especially good agent, a balancing agent for ethical restraint. As you just said, a, a person who has nothing tethering them to a, a creator or a higher power, and they, they, their ego, their training, their academic pedigree becomes the higher power, then you can give yourself any kind of justification for doing whatever, especially when it comes to genetic research, as we all know. So I see faith and theology as, as, as being a really good agent for things like teaching ethical constraint inside of a laboratory. But what are some other things that you, uh, you you think that it would come to play in? No, I, the the big one is that you say you ask this question. The material atheist has no answer to this. Is there an objective moral standard of truth? They'll say no. 
And the, the conclusion is then, then why does my opinion matter less than yours or, or vice versa? They have no answer, so they make up some arbitrary thing. They say everything's equal, which is a contradiction because they mean what they say is more important than what you say. So it, it is a, it's an absolute truth that if you don't recognize the nature of things and the inherent dignity, intrinsic value in things in the right order, then you can't assign a moral good to it. Mm. So, so scientism utterly destroys ethics, as you will notice by the kinds of experiments they do, by, by the vaccine they put out, by the cruel, cold, and calculating, murderous evil that's going on in the world today, seemingly without a conscience. Scientism leads to the psychopathic, and that's just a fact. That doesn't mean that those of us conditioned in scientism and, and act psychopathically are psychopaths, but it's a dangerous line to tread. And we ought to be really careful about how we act. And the only way to think about that is, is to answer the question. If there's a God and God made man, it, what kind of value does man have such, have such that justice or other virtues may come into play? In the scientism, there is no discussion of virtues. It's all about feelings. Hmm. So it's deadly. It's deadly. I mean, talk about virtues in the public school. You're not allowed. You're allowed to say virtues, but they would be something like being open-minded. You know, they would say that's a virtue or being tolerant uh, or, or having empathy. Anything and that, those are anything those that anything that, sub, that 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 supports that that uh, you know fatally pluralistic kind of environment where it's just like there really is no form there's no form to anything if anything could be as valid as the thing next to it then w w where are we we're, we're talking about a cell that no longer has cell walls it's that's just right. sludge so that's exactly uh, right that's that and i guess that's the, the the smallest microcosm you could you could really put out there because now uh here we are so you know what uh, i guess this brings me back to the beginning how do you or how do i Anybody who's starting, I have a, I have a two and a half year old daughter. How do I start prefacing the existence of God for a three year old or four or five year old? Where, where is the best? Where does it start? What's the best way to do it? Uh, what what has time proven to be the best way of opening up to this world? Aside from the fact that they need to learn their alphabets, they need to l learn you know uh, s space and shapes, uh, spatial uh, concepts, as as you were talking about with the the uh, the trivium and all that. Uh, where does this ethereal metaphysical education come from? Where do you start? The real place to start for all of us is with ourselves, with this quest. We have to truly answer the question. If you're on the fence or not sure or iffy about it or, or an atheist or not an atheist, you have to inquire and find out the steps it takes to make the right kind of inquiry into the nature of physics, in the nature of reality. You have to investigate time. You have to investigate being. You have to investigate first and second order questions. And when you become edified, Frank, in this truth, and you're fully committed to the discovery of, of encountering God, then and only then are you in a position to be of service to your daughter by asking her the right kinds of questions. It's important, parents don't understand this, it's important for you to tell your children the truth. If you know that God exists, it is necessary to tell your daughters and sons and everyone else. It's your job. Um, we live in this time where we, we think everybody needs to discover for themselves, but parents are a child's first teachers and teachers teach. So you tell your daughter and your children the truth and then you have investigative conversations about it. You can ask, what do you think about where the world comes from? How do we get here? Look at the moon, look at the stars. Marvel and wonder at this creation. And it's hard to see how God doesn't exist. If you are open to the fullness of reality, yeah, that's well, the beginning. Yeah, it, it is the beginning. I, I think that where, where it'd be hard for the average person, people who, 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 who go to church, who were brought up, they were raised inside a faithful uh, household community, uh, it's always been a very real thing. They were just in it from the beginning, and it's something that they don't question, and it's something that they feel great comfort with, and and, and, and they're there. They're, but, but it might be hard for people, they may not have gone through the physics, they may not have they if someone says uh well tell me why how does how do you know god exists and most people would only be able to tell you about their 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 personal 
uh, journeys through emotion, through uh, you know their experiences in church, what they feel, you know, the way that it has it has it shaped their lives and the people that they are talking with and and that they work around. But a, a lot of people don't have grasp on the science of God, uh, or they, they the average person hasn't read anybody like a a, a, um, a, a Thomas Aquinas, and it, it's just a little bit harder. That's why I wonder. You know, how much boot camp does the average parent need to go through if they're going to be homeschooling? Yeah, that's a really great question. I can tell you for myself, I was raised as a secular humanist. I was an atheist and I discovered that I had a conscience that I actually started to realize when things I were doing were wrong, were wrong. And I went on this quest to discover an authentic education. And in the process, I discovered God. So if you seek after the truth, here's the aim. Seek after the truth. Learn to know the difference between a truth and a lie. That's really a great thing to do. And that would that would include grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So it really does require a studying of the world around you. And that's hard to do because we're stuck to our screens today. We are so distracted. You're so right. I don't know how people are going to get out and learn anything today because we're busy. The world has made us busy and there's hardly anything to do. I, oh my gosh, that's 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 such a great way of saying it. So busy and there's barely anything to do. So bored but so busy. Yes. It's nuts. It really it's is. Nuts. Wow, it's wait. nuts. Wow. Put away the screens for a couple hours a day and sit and be alone. It'll drive you crazy for the first few months. And then it'll turn out to be the greatest joy of your life to start encountering truth through the great teachers. You can start with someone like Plato. It's a great guy. You could start with the Greek myths. You could start with the you could start with the Italian folk tales or the Grimm's fairy tales. Those will draw you out of this mundane scientism and into the land of wonder. Definitely do that with your kids. That's a great way to start initiating them into the transcendental realities. I think that's what that that's uh, that's a great great way of of putting it, and I'm I'm glad that we did this. I love see I love this stuff. There's something about it. Uh, theology it, it's just been so discounted for me, especially for me. It, it sounds boring, and it sounds like well, what what the hell am I ever going? To, what what would I do with this? What would I ever do with this? You know, how does it apply? I mean, I would much rather go and and be the astronomer or, or something else like that. But and where would theology even become a part of my my pursuits in astronomy? It, it oh, just yeah. never there is never any lines drawn because, of course, like everything else, it seems that we are just being severed from ever getting the full picture. We're being compartmentalized. Uh, maybe maybe uh, maybe there's a little bit of malice and a little bit of just nobody knows you know it's just ignorance but it's 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 definitely working against us definitely well and i think there's a lot of malice um it's complicated though no doubt no doubt it is steven uh it's always a wonderful time when you're when you're on i have your your uh website over here is there any appearances that you're making anything that you're writing right now that's coming out anything that uh you could you can uh you know uh, promote right now i'd love for you to plug whatever yes. you're doing Thank you so much. I'm I am writing that weekly newsletter for parents, and it's it's a deep dive into what I'm calling sophistry and the abuse of speech and the abuse of language. So I think it's a great place to start to begin to disentangle all the all the bad weeds that were planted in our souls to come to recognize the difference between a truth teller and a sophist. And you can go to my website and just sign up for the free newsletter. I just send one out every week, and I'm going to start a podcast soon with the effort to doing little courses on helping pa parents answer the kinds of questions you're asking frank that require a lot more than than 30 minutes here so i will try to articulate some of these things and take your great questions and other people's questions and try to answer them that oh that city of truth.co Yes. Okay. City of well, Truth.co. well, that's great. And the other thing there too is, I, I mean, it, hey, if you ever wanted to do a deep dive, uh, we can we can put more than a half hour on the books. I would love to. I just don't want to take too much of your time away from you. I know that we have the three hour difference, and I just try to be convenient for you. But if you ever want to do forty five minutes to an hour on a very particular topic, I would love to get lost in the weeds with you. So you just let me know. Okay, we can do that. I'd love to do that too. Uh, my whole life is all about helping families come into the fullness of truth. So 
I'd love to participate because that's what you're doing too. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Frank. I appreciate you for coming out again. Another great, great episode in the serial that we are slowly building together. Stephen Jonathan, cityoftruth.co. Have a wonderful evening, my friend, and all the best to your family. Thank you, Frank. You too. All right. See you guys. Take care. Take care. There you go. All right. 803-ish. 803-ish. I think that was fantastic. Now I just want to take calls from people and see how everybody's doing. And I have a nice little way of ending the show that'll be right there in line with what we've discussed so far. And you call in. Do we have any theology majors? Any philosophy majors out there? What came up for you tonight? And that is our Thursday. That is our Thursday. Thank you guys so much for being around, and we will be right back after this brief intermission. Don't go anywhere. In fact, keep sharing the show and get more people to show up for the second half. It's intermission time, folks. Time out. Press the like button. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Intermission. We'll, we'll be right back. Yeah, Intermission. Quite frankly. 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 We all support quite frankly. Not quite. Let's go, Brandon. Quite frankly, in Roma, Italia. Quite frankly, you're going on Frank's show tonight? I really like you. You're very smart. So everybody watch. Quite frankly, with Frank. Quite frankly. How dare you?
Okay, back from break. A little extended break tonight. I figured that it was uh, it was a good it was a good uh, mood for a song, a little song and a dance. I was dancing over here, weren't you? All right, so let's get into these super chats and see how everybody's doing. And in the meantime, I will put the number up on the screen and see who's out there in the audience. Who's out there? Is there anybody out there? Is there anybody here? So let's see if you you give me a buzz at 914-595-6953 and let's go. Twisted Clown says everyone believes in God when someone dies, when someone gets in a serious accident or when someone is getting <laughs> getting screwed. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I guess the well as they say there is, uh, there's no atheists in foxholes, but then again, I know some people who, you know, the trauma could be so bad, and that's what's so insidious about the trauma that is inflicted by, uh, clergy on, which is a widespread, very bad problem, the infiltration of that kind of abuse in church through, through clergy onto children. Because you're talking about trauma so so harsh at such a young, impressionable age that, that hope hope itself and faith itself gets burned out of you. Because how that how could this ever how could this ever be a domain in which God is is the king if this happened to me? So that's what is so insidious about about the uh, this this kind of intergenerational abuse that goes on and how it affects people and how it actually severs those connections to joy that that is it's very hard it's very hard 
in any other time of my life, any other time of my life, that's why 2022 was so important for me, aside from it being so painful, in any other year in my life, uh, that would have been an excuse for me to just go to war with God, go to war. It, 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 last year would have been that year, and it was the exact opposite. The exact opposite through everything and all the suffering I was I I bear witness to. It was uh, it was just one of those things. So I, I can see how it, get, it pulls somebody in that pain and and trauma pulls people in one direction or another, and I. Not everybody's experience is the same, no doubt. Kenny in Cleveland. Oh, wait, Twisted Clown says, Who needs late night shows? Frank, you are our evening, early morning, or midnight grind entertainment. Midnight, you know, it might be this mid, it might be this weekend that I do the Saturday night show. I was thinking about it. I might do the Saturday night show this Saturday. I'll let you know for sure by tomorrow night um, if I wanted to do it this early in the month, maybe. But I will, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. I'm thinking about doing it. Talking about midnight grinds. That used to start at midnight, those, those uh, episodes. Kenny in Cleveland said, hey, Frank, just touching on the topic of neighbors again. It's the little things people overlook when new people who are in less old school, are less old school move in. Things that affect everyone, like cleaning off drains and fire hydrants, shoveling sidewalks. Count your blessings. Oh, I know. And that's why I said I'm a good neighbor. I have elderly neighbors. I'm there with when when the the snow is light enough for snow blowing. I'm there doing it all. If it's not like it was two days ago and it was already very slushy and heavy, then I'm shoveling their walkways and and yeah, you count your blessings. Especially if you're you're old and you've seen your neighborhood change around you and the people that were there decades prior are no longer there. You hope that somebody has some compassion in helping you because, you know, it's uh, shoveling and taking out the garbage and doing other big things like that. It's not as easy once you get into your 70s and 80s. A. Blinken. What does this mean? It's either a Anthony Blinken. Is it Anthony Blinken that left me a super chat? Hey, Frank, I'm thinking of throwing my name in for the Democrat nomination for 2024. I'm a strong interventionist, and I don't negotiate with anyone unless I already know the outcome. So I think I have a good shot. Plus, crazy name recognition, huh? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, very, very strong. I don't negotiate with anybody. That's always a really the sign of a really good diplomat, just dismissing any kind of a peace offering out of hand like they did with the uh, the Chinese recently. And we'll see how it all goes. Tonight, tonight on the Thursday night after hours programming, it's Throwback Thursday. Not only are we going to have the throwback episode from 2018 or 19, it was a June, a June show, uh, 18 or 19, where I had... Um, Mr. Joseph Civitano on with us, my friend Matt's late great, uh, late grandfather, a great man, and he served under Patton, and I told you about talking to the elderly and, and just getting their stories, and I wish I, I was able to download a lot more, hey, listen, I still can, but this is one of those things I'm happy I, I've been able to do. That will be the Throwback Thursday programming tonight, along with other things that I curated, including the hour-long epi uh, episode, the full episode, the exchange between uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor and um, Michael Savage. I, sh I showed you a three-and-a-half-minute clip the other day. I, I listened to the entire hour last night as Douglas McGregor reposted it to his YouTube account. So I put that into the mix. That'll probably come afterwards with a few other things. So after show on QuiteFrankly.tv, the network, QuiteFrankly.tv, powered by Foxhole, there's going to be plenty for you to watch. Throwback stuff, really good stuff, history, human interest, and then a little bit of news from around the world. Finally, Elizabeth Stebbins says, Hey, Frank, I watch your show every morning in my kitchen. My parents and grandparents are Italian from New Rochelle. Right next door, huh? I have alpha gal syndrome from a lone star tick. 
It has turned my life upside down. Maybe you can shed some light on this on your show. Alpha gal syndrome from a lone star tick. A tick out there. Mm, alpha gal syndrome. This is something that I need to even look into. Alpha gal syndrome. Maybe I can give that to Jay Gulanello from now until tomorrow and see what he comes up with. I've never heard of it. Of course, we know all about... Um, we know all about uh, d- d- Lyme disease over here. That was created off the coast, off the tip of uh, Long Island and uh, and flew across to Lyme, Connecticut. And now out- Lyme disease is supposedly all over the place. It's not a northeastern forest thing it's all over but alpha gal syndrome i gotta i gotta write this down very sorry to hear that uh because i didn't know what you were talking about i thought you were like saying something cute i've got alpha gal syndrome you know like i'm an alpha gal and uh and then i then you said then you said a lone star tick i'm like a tick what is that like a like i've got a I've got a little bit of long, I feel like a, a nervous tick. I, and then it all started coming together to me. You're talking about a disease. I'll look into it. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I did not understand. Uh, let's see here. Cajun Lady Sarah says, best way to start children on the journey to God is to teach them to pray. Saying grace at dinner, saying bedtime prayers, simple prayers. They follow our examples. Prayers is the most personal way to encounter God and the truth. Great show and guests. You know, uh, wonderful, wonderful reminder. You're right. We don't pray at dinner uh, enough, and now we're all having dinner together since I, I've been working with my eating windows and stuff like that, and I think that, that has to start. You're right. And um, she's just too young to be taking to church. I can't stand hearing the, the sounds of uh, just like, playing and squealing and everything else going on in the back of a church obviously the kids aren't ready um but really um really good reminder right there and very simple advice thank you cajun lady yeah um yeah let's move on let's move on a little bit over here on rockfin i got a tip from twisted wizard god help us from the gospel of thomas jesus says Number two, the one who seeks should not cease seeking until he finds, and when he finds, he will be dismayed. When he finds, he will be dismayed, and when he is dismayed, he will be astonished, and he will be king over the all. And number 48, if two make peace with one another in one and the same house, then they will say to the mountain, move away, and it will move away. Hmm. Especially that first one. You you always there's always there's always unexpected discoveries along the way. You're trying to scratch an itch. The inquiry, it brings you places. It changes you in ways you never knew before the quest began. Um, let's see here. Gail Q Stang says, "Love your show, frankly. Thank you, Gail. It's wonderful to have you out there. I think that's the first time I've noticed Gail in the Rumble rants." So I hope I see more of her. Thank you. Wart guy. I know this guy. On Rumble. Says, Frank and Jonathan, are you familiar with presuppositional apologetics? Seen the Bonson. Bonson Stein debate on YouTube. Christian versus atheist. No, I have not seen that. And Wart guy, if you can, please copy and paste your entire your entire rumble rant and email it to me quite frankly podcast at gmail.com because i would like to look into the presuppositional apologetics and maybe that could be a a future topic and i'd also like to take a look at this debate all right what else we have here over to pilled and remember the yeah you keep those phones warm you call on in and we'll get to you in just a second this is the last batch of super chats i'm looking at before we get to your calls Let's see here. Jesse, thank you. C. Blanche says, cheers, pal. Here's still from the way back times. Never left, never will. Great to have you there. Sean Joe, thank you. Delona, 
Thank you so much. Warrior, warrior for Jesus says, God bless you, brother. Love to see, love to see Tracy on Foxhole. Is she there or you would love to see her there? She doesn't do a lot of streaming. So um, maybe if she starts streaming, I told her she should. She should do news briefs throughout the day. She should, uh, you know, maybe she does a lot of writing. She does a lot, a lot of a lot of threading on Twitter and all that. She should put that to use and just report on her own threads and read them onto these little five to fifteen minute long news briefs on things like Rumble and Getter and Foxhole things like that. She should do it. I told you, you should do it, absolutely. But everybody's got a schedule. Jesse, thank you. Chai Possum says, thanks, Frank. Now I have to go bleach my brain of the view. <laughs> That's my fault. Swickly says, what are your thoughts about Microsoft trying to acquire Activision, asking for a friend? I don't know. That's video games, right? All those kind of, all those mergers are suspect because you just don't know what the end game is. You just don't know how immersive and how metaverse they want to get with all this stuff and, and what where it's all leading. Let's see. Living the dream. Living the dream with Jesus makes it a lot better, says Warrior. Our cloaked unseen says follow the energy frequency and vibration of everything. It will always lead to the only thing that truly matters. Katie B says love meeting Steve and Jonathan. Thanks, Frank. Keith says philosophy of logic was a life-changing course should be offered regularly throughout all education levels. The philosophy of logic. Hmm. And Chai Possum says, is Steven Jonathan on Twitter? That I don't know, but I put his website inside of the description of this episode. Right now, it's on YouTube. Cityoftruth.co. I am certain that there has to be some kind of contact over there. Uh, because he has encouraged the audience to contact him and he's pretty good about responding. So if he has a Twitter, if it's not listed on the website, I'm sure you can ask and he can tell you. So there you have it. Now let's go on over to the calls. First one up is Kim from the high desert. Oh, it was. Now it's 412. You're no. Hello? All right. Weird shit's happening right now. Here we go. 541. You're on the air. Hold on a second. The speaker is muted. Go ahead, 541. Hi, Frank. Good to have you uh, on. Great show. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris. Uh, my ex had Alpha Gal. Tell me about this. What is it? it so she's from Texas. Uh, she got bit by a tick. She then had violent reactions to red meat, like uh, aller allergic reactions. She grew up eating steak, Texan all the way, and she one day basically got uh, to the eating steak part of the day and it went all wrong. <clears throat> and then I think she had it for four years before she met me. And uh, my number was 541 is an Oregon, Oregon code. Uh, we met in Oregon. She still had it there. We would try every now and again um, with like Buffalo and stuff like that. Uh, she could eat chicken, fish, all that, but she couldn't eat red meat. And then um, I think you might have even seen uh, the the WEF people alluding to it. Yes. Yeah, there's a there's like that little Asian guy who not no no Harari, but no, I know the guy I, who was I, talking I, about breeding tiny humans. Yes, I know who you're talking about. It's the first person I was thinking about. Uh, uh, but that, that's yeah. why my next question was going to be, well, I have a lot of questions at this point about Alpha Gal, even though it's, it's off topic, but now, yeah. now, now I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, is it is it yeah. just, it's just an allergy or a reaction to red meat? I mean, this this uh, our, our audience member here said that her life has been turned completely upside down. If that is a part, a, a major part of your diet, I can see how it is, but uh, you know, yeah. what else, what else comes along with it aside from the meat allergy? Well, it's um, it's extremely gastrointestinally uh, challenging. We'll, we might say about it. Um, so yeah, I could see how that would be. But other than that, my ex didn't have a whole lot of problems. She just had to be really careful about uh, managing her her diet, and it, it definitely hit her in Texas when she was in Texas. And then uh, we we moved, we had to move out of Oregon because. 
well, you're aware of what happened in Oregon, all the fires, right? Um, we were by the Beachy Creek fire and, uh, it, I, I worked at the university, um, there. Well, Chris, Chris, and, uh, well, well, Chris, uh, I, 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 I yeah. have, to, I have, I'm sorry, because this is an extracurricular topic. I have to keep this a little bit, uh, oh. tighter, but let me just well, ask, let me ask what, what you but, know about what you know about the alpha gal thing, um, uh, and, and this particular tick, uh, how long has this been known to people? I honestly don't. And I was a, I, I was a okay. science teacher. So the scientism thing is actually what I wanted to call, call about. I left a career, uh, teaching at a university over scientism. Um, but I only became aware of alpha gal dating this lady. Um, and I started dating her in 2018. So I, I'd never heard of it before then. And, uh, then even in like my rural Missouri magazine this month, they have an alpha gal recipe for emu tacos or something like that. Gotcha. Um, so I think it's I think it's one of these things that's kind of happening as all of this great turning stuff is happening. Um, I never I had never dealt with it, and I dealt with thousands of people a year at my job uh, teaching. So it it. I never run into it. And then 2018 ran into it with a woman from Texas. Gotcha. And then, uh, okay. it's been more and more prevalent. Well, well, well I, 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 I'll oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, like I said, I have, I have to wrap, wrap this up and, and take a couple more calls, but I appreciate yeah. that. And I know you said Absolutely. that the, that uh, other than that, that you did work, uh, around these science types and you, you didn't, you couldn't be around the, the religious chemistry prof. And and it just you couldn't be around the religious nature of it all. Like, give me an example of the kind of thing you couldn't stand anymore. Just one example. Um, my, so I worked with a rather unimpressive scientist uh, who knew that was not that he was not going to advance under those conditions. So he got himself a, a breast job, much like the not not as drastic as the Canadian shop teacher situation. But, uh, and then within a year, he was dean. Uh, uh, she, she was dean of the, the college. And uh, that was a pure intersectional exaltation. Of, there you go. Uh, you know, ridding oneself of the sin of being male was extremely celebrated. No doubt. At, the, at that institution. I know exactly what you're talking so like, about uh, now. So the promotion of people who don't mm-hmm. deserve it because they're checking boxes, that's number one. Oh, massive amounts of that, but it also happened with the students. And in Oregon, they would shut down the entire classroom if a student threw uh, a, a tantrum. Mm-hmm. So the students just weren't learning. And I, I had to do, I was a chemistry guy, so we did story problems all the time. So people needed to read and do math, right? And we'd get these people in, and over time, the students stopped being able to read. The American students stopped being able to read. It was to the point where our Chinese foreign nationals, I didn't even give them a chemistry test as their first test. I just gave them a literacy test to see where things were uh, because we would get these edicts that everybody needed to perform the same, the social emotional stuff, the, um, oh gosh, it was, and I would tape some of these meetings, but it was, it, you know, I can't use that or share it because of the, the single party laws in Oregon, but they, they, uh, Oh my gosh, they they just would say things like they don't need to be able to read, they need to be able to get good grades type activities. And so we'd be giving them extremely uh uh we'd lie to them to their to their faces, to their parents, take their money and just lie to them about what their actual capabilities were. Our average Oregonian students were coming in in the engineering program with a sixth grade reading level, Frank. And we were supposed to tell them that they were like super smart, regardless of how they actually tested. And if the test didn't go well, well, it was our fault because we didn't truly understand their culture or something like that. Wow. And uh, I mean, it's not, it's not a, it's not surprising in the least, but when you say that you are, you're, you're, you're overseeing engineering, uh, a program, chemical engineering you're talking about. Uh, both. Uh, I, I did, uh, 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 well, I worked with the electricals, the mechanicals, the civils, 
and also the chemical engineers. I did summer. I did their sixth summer grade. School. Sixth grade reading levels. You're talking about at that the, point. The average American was coming in with a sixth grade reading level, and this was the, the worst part. Is I presented this data, and um, this is a mathematical thing. Imagine a fraction where you have a fraction in the numerator and a fraction in the denominator, a fraction on the top and a fraction on the bottom. I was in a meeting, right, because I was I was trying to present like, hey, we have a bigger problem here. The bigger problem is that these students aren't going to be able to do chemistry because they can't read, and it's, they can they can they could do math at about a tenth grade level, but they can't do it at a college level. And I was trying to present to these people who had ridden the system from post World War II, where people with standards had held those standards for them. So they believed that the oncoming people would be able to keep those standards without ever being held to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so that that functionally, uh, it was dysfunctional. It was wildly dysfunctional. And, and what year and and what year was this, uh, Chris, when they I you worked left? In that, I worked in that field from about, uh, well, I was like, because when you're a PhD student or whatever, you, you have to teach to be a teaching assistant. So I was in the collegiate atmosphere from about 2006 until 2020. And I, I mean, I was working with thousands of people. So in, in my incoming class, here's another example. In my in, incoming classes, when I first started, we would have some gender benders. Out of a thousand people, we'd have maybe three. Mm-hmm. When I left, it was top in a hundred. Right? So that, that's not an organic growth. No, it's not uh, of a of a natural situation playing out. No, and, and, it and just the place like, was rewarding it. Just Sorry, like go yeah, ahead. yeah, it's going to reward it. Like we said last night, all of a sudden we have yeah. w- what we knew that if you just let all things be as they are, maybe two percent of any population will end up uh, will end up as they get into their their adult lives. They'll they'll identify as as gay. On this, on, on a sexuality basis, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. we're just talking about sexuality right. at that point. But now we're talking seven point two percent of adults, including twenty percent of this latest Gen Z uh, generation, say that they are right. something other than heterosexual. And we know inside of that is not even talking about sexuality exclusively anymore. We're talking about uh, a, 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 some kind of a dysphoric uh, relationship with your own body. So I mean, there, there's well, there's there, so much there going on. There's a lot here. of that too, though. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the the but Chris Robotics Club was putting stuff into people's hands. They they were doing the chips in like 2016, right? They were chipping kids and pump, pumping it up all over the school stuff. Oh yeah, we can we can get a thing out of the vending machine with a chip in our hand, you know? And they were pumping that up too. Jeez. It's all a transhumanism thing. Wow, I did tell so, you. So you guys yeah. were, you guys yeah. were a, you guys were a, a testing site for some of that. It's it's incredible. And see, Huge. these are these yeah. are the stories that we don't even we don't even hear from because there's just so many universities and uh, many of these uh, these faculty centers are so tight knit. Most people like you are just silenced by uh, wanting to keep their jobs, yeah. or people like you just right. don't exist. So it, it, it nobody even knows that this is happening. Chris, listen, um, I two I, of us, two of us fled. Well, I gotta, I gotta take a couple of more calls, right. or else. But let me yeah. just say, uh, this—the eleven minutes I spent with you was a- absolutely fantastic. Oh, wow. And thank you for, uh, thank you for giving me all this, my friend. Hey, thank you, Frank, for putting on a great show and uh, helping get some good stuff out with that CBD. No, oh, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Really do. That is Chris. I saved him as Chris X Chem Professor. Well. Obviously, we started off with Alpha Gal, which I have it over here. I'm looking at some old Reddit threads. Somebody nine years ago said, "I've had this for almost four years now. I can't even I can't even eat fish or game, only poultry. You get used to it after a while because vomiting, diarrhea, hives, and using an EpiPen are not worth the trouble of eating bacon." This is a medical paper on the phenomena, so it it, it came out. So obviously, it's been around. I'd never heard of it. And uh, but I gotta I'm gonna save this because I want to ask Jay Gulanello about that though nutritionally that's how the hell do you fix that that's incredible uh, let's see here let's take a call Rodney from Virginia what's going on Rodney 
Hey, how's it going? It's going. Um, it's, this ain't Frank, is it? No, 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 it's not. Okay, this is the pre-call. This is the pre-call. Um, well, I have several things to talk about, sir. Um, I mean, I have a couple paranormal stories about that. Well, that's kind of a sad one. My wife was dying of cancer. Well, wait, 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 uh, Rodney, God Rodney. Let, God what? let me know he was listening. It's a strange story, but I think Frank might like it and the well, listeners. Rodney, I, I was just, it is me, Frank. I don't, I don't have a, a call a call screener. But my my gosh, oh. my gosh! I, I I mean, this is this is about this. That's your paranormal story, or or is that the about faith? Uh, well, it was kind of a it's a story, Frank. Where I, I uh, my wife was dying of cancer, and I had hospice. Okay, well, she had pancreatic cancer, and she was older than me. Um, and I, I don't know. You probably don't have time, do you? Or well, maybe I can save this for another call, or it, so, or you can play it. If this is the paranormal uh, story, if this is what you're talking about, then uh, I, what what I would say is... Well, I prayed. I prayed a certain prayer, okay? And, and she had a hospice nurse that would come over. One night I put her down to bed because she was taking some high pain meds. And I went back in the living room and I prayed a prayer to God. I, I asked God that because I saw my wife was getting skinnier and, and looking, you know, like she was having the life sucked out of her with cancer you know so i prayed a prayer to god that if, if he could send her mom her dad or and her ex-husband to come down and welcome her into heaven that i would appreciate it because i'm afraid i may wake up and she may be gone next to me you know mm -hmm. and i said that though in a prayer inside my head quietly with my arms bowed across my lazy boy with my knees on the floor, you know, just I, I kind of just sat down and, and said a prayer to God after I put her down to please let her mom or dad and her ex-husband come down that had all died within a year. Uh, that's why I fell in love with her because I knew she had been traumatized so much and I wanted to help her. We met over the Xbox playing Texas Hold'em and I went over to England and, and helped her sort out a, a bad boyfriend that she let live with her and uh he was badgering her for money she gave him a car i i, I told her he stole her credit card and she gave him a car and uh to, to move out well i told her that well we were no good and then i went over there and protected her but that's another story yeah, it's but a anyways, completely different story so the hospice nurse came in a, a few days later and uh was talking to my wife and said you know, Diane, uh, I know you've been taking more pain meds and you've been sleeping more. Have you had any good dreams lately? And I was sitting there in the Lazy Boy, and my wife turned to her and said, Oh, yeah, I dreamt that me and Rod were out at an outside cafe having dinner with my mom, my dad, and my late husband. Dude, a shock went down my back because I knew I prayed for those exact people two days before in my head. And a shock went down my back, knocked me out of my lazy boy. I went right into the bathroom, and the hairs on my forearms were standing straight up in the air. And uh, tears were coming out of my eyes because I knew I had prayed that exact for those exact people, you know. And 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 she she passed shortly after that. Um, no, I I talked to her. And uh, asked her if she had ever said John's prayer and had been saved. And she said, well, no, but I I've been to church when I was young. And I told her, well, we got to get a preacher over here. And I got a preacher over there, and we said John's prayer after that. And then she, uh, about a week or two later, she had to go into the hospital for her last week alive. Um well, Rodney, but, I I I'm, I appreciate you. I I, I know that uh, it gave yeah. me hope that God heard my prayer, and He's still out there, Frank. Oh, I know. I, that's, you know? that's what I'm taking from this. Obviously, that's that's one that's one of those things that I mean, my my hair was standing up too when I I knew where it was going. Obviously, as you're setting up the story, and um, that I would have it would have that same impact on me as well, and I'm sure many people in this in this audience. 
So yeah, I'll get the story down in a better form, and and maybe I can call you back a, and uh, give it to you in a better form. Well, you know, where I, it will have a bigger. Because I also after that, after she died, I quit drinking. I I I mean, I was drinking scotch, man, and we were we were social drinkers over the Xbox. Um, I. I Anyways, it's a long, it's a beautiful story. I asked her to marry me at Stonehenge after I got that guy to leave her alone. And I, we came back here to America, and my wife was British. And uh, we bought a home here in Virginia, and um, we had a great seven years of a beautiful marriage. She was my soulmate. Our energies just matched, you know. And, and then she had cancer, but. Uh, but that's back in 2016. Well, Rodney, I'm now thinking but, about going to retire in Thailand. Actually, well, hey, wherever, and wherever, go, go and visit all the beaches in Thailand. Wherever you're going to find some peace, and wherever you're going to find some relaxation, and wherever you're going to be able to contemplate uh, wh- wh- where your life was and where you're going, and however you're going to in- to really just indulge in that beauty of uh, of it all. If, if it's on a beach in Thailand, and thank you for the call, and thank you for sharing. If it's on a beach in Thailand or if it's Virginia Beach, whatever it is, I that's definitely a, a journey you're on and you should definitely continue to pursue. And yeah, that's that's one hell of a story. And it goes in hand it goes hand in hand. You don't need to be a theology, uh you don't have to be a theologian to have an experience like that and have it become a, a personal revelation. A personal revelation that will just say, as long as it's real and it's an affirmation for you, a confirmation for you, really that's uh, that's it. As far as passing that on and making it real to somebody else, that's always the trick, which is why I like talking about this with, uh, with Steve and Jonathan tonight. How do you make that more universal for people? Where is that scientific uh, approach to making it real for more people? Because I know many people in this audience, and my, I myself have had moments of confirmation, revelation, some more important than the other. I have never, I haven't had a road to Damascus moment. That that hasn't happened yet. Nervous about one of those things if I ever had one of those. But at the same time, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be a trip? But I I want to read something to you, and then I want to end this show in the way that I had planned to do. This is the second half of the Eric Adams thing. Since we're talking about faith um, and everything else, listen to this. Here's the second half of the Eric Adams Daily Caller article. He predictably drew rebuke from those on the left who decried his comments as unconstitutional because of the alleged separation of church and state. But that's the thing. There's no such thing as a constitutionally mandated separation of church and state. Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter in 1802 known as the Danbury Baptist Letter in which he assured religious leaders the government would not encroach upon their religious liberties. Quote, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with severin uh, with the way I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which de- uh, declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state, Jefferson wrote. One cannot in good faith argue that Jefferson or any other founding father wanted a godless society or government. The founders never advocated for a theocracy, but conversely never omitted their faith from their work. Yet Democrats and Republicans have relied heavily on a few Supreme Court cases that cited Jefferson's phraseology as irrefutable proof that the founders intended some level of separation between church and state. While there can be a separation of the state and the church as an institution, there shouldn't be a separation between state and God. Washington invoked God during his inauguration speech when he literally said it would be wrong not to give praise to God. Here's a quote. It would be peculiarly improper to admit in this first official act my fervent supplications to the almighty being who rules over the universe. 
who presides in the councils of nations and who pro, uh, whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States, Washington said. Could you even imagine an American politician speaking like that? And he was self-educated. Can you even imagine an American politician speaking like that? Can you, can you think of what, uh, what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez can try to throw up against that, that one line? And he later invoked religion in his farewell address, his farewell address quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political pl- prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Jefferson followed suit as well, and he goes on. They talk about in God we trust being put on the treasury and the godless money at the time. But I will say this. I, wanted, I want to leave you with a little, it's 848, and I have something that's going to play for about 10 minutes. And that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, I, I want to watch something with you. And f- for those of you in podcast land, it's a great listen as well. So you are not going to miss out. I put this video, this particular presentation of David Barton up on the website, on quitefrankly.tv, on the network programming, specifically around 4th of July programming where people are just hungry for American history and things to feel good about. And I like to dust it off a little bit from time to time. And tonight, I'm going to do it for you right now. I uh, have a nice 10-minute segment or so from what is now a classic David Barton presentation, which ties theology, education, the American founding, and this concept of separation of church and state all together. So I want you to pretend that you're in a classroom with me and the teacher has just rolled in the big television. You remember this television on the roller cart? Tell me the nostalgic, the nostalgic excitement that pops up for you when you see that. When you walk into a classroom and the TV and the VCR were sitting there, you knew that you were going to watch a movie or some kind of a pre... It didn't matter. It didn't matter because what mattered was the lights were going to be off, the TV was going to be on, and it was going to be awesome. didn't matter what it was about. So this is what I'm going to leave you with. Separation of church and state. We're going to go about for about 10 minutes right to the end, and we're going to go right into our Super Chats. So ladies and gentlemen, please, no more Super Chats. I'm all up to date here. I'm all up to date, so no more Super Chats, so I don't have to, to make another awkward stop and read those. Just enjoy the rest of the night, and, uh, and let's go for it responsible for what we I'm writing a history book who's responsible for what we have today and John Adams said do you want to know who's responsible for all the the independence and things you enjoy today yeah that's it he said well he said right up top you got to put the Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper who anybody studied that in your textbooks probably not John Adams who was there said hey right at the top he said you also have to have the, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew and don't forget the Reverend George Whitfield and of course the Reverend Charles John he goes through and lists preachers said these are the guys there's no way we study preachers today in textbooks as being responsible for what we have in America, the exceptions that we have. You know what? We don't study preachers, whether they're white, whether they're black. I mean, who in the world is Richard Allen or Absalom Jones or John Moran or Lemuel? Hey, we don't know these guys today. They're huge. Matter of fact, he is back one of the... We, we really treat black history very bad today. Uh, basically, we think black history starts with MLK, with the Civil Rights Movement. No. You go back in the founding era with all the black founding fathers we never talk about. Do you know we had blacks elected office in 1768 in New Hampshire? They held a black Wentworth Cheswell. Uh, he held office for 49 years, held eight different political positions. We had blacks elected office back then. There never was a time in the history of Massachusetts when blacks could not vote. When the U.S. Constitution was ratified in Baltimore, more blacks than votes were voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution. You got guys like Lemuel Haynes, the first black man to ever h- hold a higher degree of education in America. He was a soldier in the American Revolution. He founded churches all over America. First black man to have a sermon preached. He was, as a soldier in the Revolution, and his churches, uh, George Washington was his commander-in-chief, and his churches, every year on George Washington's birthday, he would have a special sermon on George Washington, his commander-in-chief, with whom he had served. We don't hear anything about those kind of guys, or Thomas Hercules, who served in office back in the founding era. We don't hear about Prince Sisson or Oliver Cromwell. We don't hear about Peter Salem. We don't hear about Prince Esterbrook. All the black founding fathers, we don't, we don't cover that. But back, back to this thing, why would John Adams point to so 
many preachers and say these are the guys responsible. Well, the answer is, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration opens with 161 words that set forth six principles of American government. Everything in the Constitution goes back to one of those six principles. Then they gave 27 grievances showing how that all those principles have been violated by Great Britain. Interestingly enough, what we know is that all of those rights set forth in the Declaration of Independence, every one of them had been preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. You know what that means? That means the Declaration of Independence is a listen to the sermons we were hearing for 20 years leading up to the American Revolution. Whoever reads the Declaration of Independence is a sermon topic list. But that's exactly what it was. You see, that's how America was founded back in the beginning. That's what the eyewitnesses told us, but that's not what we present today. And it's interesting, these are the guys we call our founding fathers. See, there's a 56 that signed the Declaration of Independence. The first time they ever got together was in 1774, the first provincial congress. In 1774, when they got together, these guys didn't know each other. I mean, John Adams didn't know the guys from Georgia, and the guys from Pennsylvania didn't know the, the guys over here from Delaware. I, they, they had no clue. I mean, the first time. They, so what do they do first time they get together? First thing they do is they open with prayer. Now, the prayer that they opened with was not a dinky little civic prayer, God bless this meeting. It was a two-hour prayer session they had to open the first Congress of the United States. And it didn't just stop there. According to John Adams, who was there, John Adams said that they also studied four chapters of the Bible that morning in Congress. About two hours, prayer, Bible study. And out of that Bible study, he said that God showed them things out of Psalm 35 that changed their whole attitude. They believed for the first time that they could defeat the British in the coming conflict. So he writes his wife, Abigail. He says, Abigail, I must beg you to read that Psalm. Read the 35th Psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. Abigail, you got to let everybody know what God showed us this morning in Psalm 35. Man, we didn't even know they had prayer, much less a Bible study, much less God spoke to them in Bible study, much less he wanted everybody to know what God showed them in the Bible study. But he didn't stop there. He continued to say, Abigail, he says, we've appointed a continental fast. In other words, they set up a, a, a call for a day of prayer and fasting. He said, millions of people on their knees at once before their great creator, employing his forgiveness and blessings, his smiles on American council and arms. Abigail, can you imagine what happens when you get three million Americans praying and fasting? That's what we had back then. But the whole nation's called to pray and fast. And so we had this time of prayer and fasting, and that was the first of 15 times that Congress called the people of the United States to prayer. And it alternated between prayer and fasting and prayer and thanksgiving. We would have a time of prayer and fasting like that time, and invariably, a few months later, God's answering prayers like crazy, and so we would have a time of prayer and thanksgiving. And say, you remember all that stuff we prayed and fasted about? Look how God's answered. Let's thank God. And so 15 times we go back and forth between praying and fasting, and wow, look how God answered the prayers. Let's pray and fast. Wow, look how God answered. So 15 times back and forth. We were so much into praying that you will find that by the time you get to 1815, there had been 1,400 government-issued calls to prayer in America. Now, you imagine that in the climate we're in today. I mean, you can't even have a kid say God at graduation. 1,400 times the government called us to prayer by 1815? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things we do at Wall Builders. Wall Builders is a name taken out of the Bible book of Nehemiah. It's a grassroots effort where people get involved to rebuild their communities. We really like the, the thing where Josiah discovered the scrolls in the temple, brought it out and said, wow, I didn't know we used to be like this. When they found their history, it led to a national revival. So at wallbuilders.com, we put these proclamations, we own these proclamations. We put them up where people can see them. It's amazing to see how different we were back then and what we're told today back then was, oh, they were a bunch of atheist agnostics. Theists. They were, it was a secular founding. Well, then what do you do with all this? Well, going back to this first call to prayer, the first prayer and fasting we had, it's interesting that just a few weeks later, there were so many things happening in America that John Adams wrote Abigail and said, Abigail, he said, You're not, you remember that day of prayer and fasting? You're not going to believe what's happening. And so he starts going through all these things that are happening. And he said, you know, Colonel Smith and a group of his men, a bunch of farmers took a British fort. And man, that's like a bunch of rednecks taking on the seals. I mean, that doesn't happen. But here you got a bunch of farmers who took the fort from the British. He said, we even captured a 64-gun British man of war and a 20-gun British man of war, which is especially interesting because we didn't have a Navy yet. So we're actually capturing their ships. Well, we kind of did have a Navy. Let me take that back a little bit. If you ever want to see what the American Navy looks like, you go to Washington, D.C., go to the American History Museum, go up on the third floor, and you can see the American Navy. It's called the Gunboat Philadelphia. It essentially is a rowboat with a cannon at each end. That is the American Man, don't you know that scared the British when they saw that coming out? Are you kidding me? 
We capture a 64-gun British man of war and a 20-gun. So all this stuff is happening, and, and they were all talking about it. John Adams was there with some other guys. They saw. So what did they conclude? Well, I, I mean, seeing all this stuff happen that shouldn't be happening, what did they conclude? He said, Abigail, he said, it appears to me the eternal Son of God is operating powerfully against the British nation. He said, the only way you can explain this is supernatural. God's showing up and God's intervening. There's no other way to explain what's going on with this. So you find this tone being set there. And as you go through the, the American Revolution, you find so many accounts where God showed up. Matter of fact, by the time you get to 1778, George Washington wrote a letter to one of his generals, Thomas Nelson. Thomas, General Thomas Nelson signed the Declaration of Independence, one of the, the founding fathers. And he said, General, he said, what you and I have seen in this revolution, all, all the th we've seen God show up so many times. He said, the people have, could have seen what you and I have seen in fighting this. This is what he said. He said, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that hath not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. If you see what we've seen, if you see how many times God shows up, and if you don't feel an obligation to acknowledge God, to thank God, he said, you're not just an infidel, you're wicked. I mean, if, if, you, if your heart doesn't tell you, you need to be thanking God for all you've seen him do, if you don't feel that inclination, you're just flat wicked. That's George Washington talking to one of his generals, said, man, we've seen God show up so many times that if you don't feel like you have an obligation to thank God, you're just, you're, you're, you're pagan. I mean, that's George Washington saying it. By the time you get to 1781, that's the final battle of the American Revolution. In 1781, the British lay down their arms at Yorktown, and now for the first time in 150 years, British policy does not make any difference to America anymore. Now, the reason that's significant is one of the British policies we had lived under was the British said, hey, we have a state-established church, and whatever the king is, that's what you're all going to be. So if King's Anglican, that's us. If he's Catholic, that's us. And so we were not allowed in America to print Bibles in the English language. The crown would tell us what to use because we have a state-established church. But now, it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not under that anymore. We, we can do what we want to. We're, we're not under the British law anymore, which is why 1781, Battle of Yorktown, they came forward to the plan to print the first English language Bible in America. It rolled off the presses in 1782. This Bible here is known as the Bible of the Revolution. It's one of the rarest books in the world. There's 10,000 originally printed. There's about eight, eight of them left in private hands today. I have one of those, those originals. This Bible, how did it come about, this first Bible printed in the English language in America? Well, it came about in a fairly interesting way. It came about because Robert Aiken, right here, the official printer to Congress said, hey, let's just print a Bible now. We, we can do this. And so that's what happened. And so you find in the front of the Bible, there is a congressional committee appointed to oversee the printing of the Bible. You have the chaplains of Congress who sign off and said the Bible is, nobody's changed it. It's exactly what God said. And it has this at the bottom. It has an endorsement. It says, Resolved, the United States and Congress assembled to recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. Congress endorsing a Bible? They can't do that. Separation? Wait a minute. They're the guys who gave us separation. I think they know what it means. And they knew that it did not mean secularize the country. It meant don't have a national denomination. Don't say we all have to be Catholics or Anglicans or whatever. There was no thought of taking God out. So here, the first Bible printed in English in America, in the, and it's in the American Revolution, is done with the recommendation of Congress. Now, why would he do that? Because, see, Robert Aiken told Congress, if we do this, he said, this will be, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. Whoa, so the first Bible printed in English is for the use of schools, and it gets printed, and it has a congressional endorsement in front. By the way, here's the actual handwritten document on it. It says, it's a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of schools. First Bible printed in English in America, congressional endorsement, and it's a Bible for the use of schools. Don't hear that in history today. The very next year, 1783, is when we signed the peace treaty in the American Revolution. Ben Franklin, John Adams, John Jay. Here is that peace treaty. You can actually go to the State Department up on the sixth floor, the John Quincy Adams State Drawing Room. You can see the document that secured American independence, and it's signed right there, John Adams, Ben Franklin, and John Jay. Notice the title on the document. The biggest letters on the whole thing right there. In the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. I could be mistaken, but I think that's Christian. I'll catch you on the flip side.
quite frankly, is filled for a live studio audience. And now our super chatters, starting with Cajun Lady Sarah, Twisted Clown, Kenny in Cleveland, a- Anthony Blinken, <laughs> Elizabeth Stabbins, and Twisted Wizard over there on Rockfin. Thank you guys and gals, especially to my friends, Wart Guy and Gail Q. Stang on Rumble. Until tomorrow, we're closing out the week strong with Jay Gulinello and Matt in studio. So I'll see you then. Get on over to QuiteFrankly.tv. It's Throwback Thursdays. If you want to see a great classic episode of Quite Frankly, get to QuiteFrankly.tv and make yourself at home in the chat.